Well, welcome to the Movement Church Online. I'm Chris. I'm the lead pastor here at Movement Church, and we're so glad that you're joining us online today. Uh, today, we begin a brand new series called Self, which, by the way, is about yourself. So we're going to talk about you, and we're going to talk about discovering who you are called to be and how God has called you to live as yourself. So make sure you're paying attention today. Also, I'd encourage you, this content could be really helpful for someone that you know, someone that you love, someone that you want to take a step in their relationship with Jesus Christ, or maybe begin to take a first step towards a relationship with Jesus Christ. So I would encourage you to take this information and share it away, whether it's on Facebook or on YouTube. We would just love to share this information and this content with as many people as possible, because like we say every Sunday, we exist to help people take a step in their relationship with Jesus Christ, whether that's their first step or their next step. So some of the first steps may happen by you sharing this content in this, in this video. So we'd love for you to do that. Today, we're going to jump right in to self part one. Well, today we are jumping right into our brand new series called Self, where we are going to talk about, you guessed it, ourselves, yourself, myself, and who ourselves are called to be as we follow God, as we follow Jesus, as we live for God and live for Jesus in our world. So we're going to talk about ourselves. Now, self is an interesting concept to try to pin down exactly what we're talking about. And in fact, the reason I say that in preparing is that, is that in preparing for this series, I knew what I was talking about when I think of self, but self is actually defined in really different ways and actually defined in ways that sometimes completely contradict each other. So let's look at a few definitions of self. Each of these seven definitions of self, seven definitions of self, all come from Merriam Webster. Here's the seven different definitions of self. Number one, it's an individual's typical behavior or character. So how you typically respond, how you would respond most of the time, what your character is most of the time. Number two, it's an individual's temporary behavior or character. So when we don't respond the way that we normally respond, this temporary behavior, this temporary character is also our self. Number three, it's a person in prime condition. So how you respond, what your character is when you are at your best, that's also yourself. Isn't this ironic? Who you are most of the time, who you are at this specific time, and who you are at the best of times, that's all yourself. Number four is the union of elements that constitute the individuality of a person who you are in total, everything about you that makes up who you are. Number five, the entire person of an individual. Number six is the embodiment of an abstraction. Crickets. You're like, well, I don't even know. I have no idea what that even really means, but that's the definition that yourself, myself, we are the embodiment of an abstraction. Congratulations. You didn't even know that was true about you. And number seven, it's the material that is part of an individual organism. In other words, the body has this ability to distinguish objects that are self from non-self, things that belong because they are part of us and things that don't belong because they are not a part of us. Now, it's kind of funny to think that there are so many different definitions of self, but at the same time, doesn't that ring true of what we know to be true of ourselves? That we have this tendency to go back and forth and to not just be one thing at all times. That what's true of us typically and what's true of us temporarily and what's true of us at our best, those are all true of ourselves. That when we're confident and when we're insecure, those are both true of ourselves. That when we're brave and when we're fearful, those are both true of ourselves. And we're not running in different, we're, even though we're running in different directions, it seems that's both true of ourselves. So here's what I want to say as, as we begin this series. We don't always know how to define self, but we certainly know what we expect of ourself. We don't always know what we're talking about or how we would define the idea of a self, but we certainly know what we expect of and from ourselves or what we expect of ourselves at, the, at our best or what we'd expect for people who are truly accomplishing things in life or what we would hope to be true of ourselves. And here's what we expect of ourselves and here's what we want to be true of ourselves. We want ourselves to be self-confident, to be self-reliant, to be self-assured, and to be self fulfilled. Let me say those again. We want ourselves to be self-confident, self-reliant, self-assured, and self- 
fulfilled. Let me break those down. When I say we want ourselves to be self-confident, we want and expect of ourselves that I will know who I am. I know who I am and I am confident in who I am. I am an independent person. I have di distinguished my own identity. I have my own character. I am confident in who I am and who I am going to be moving forward. I am confident in myself. I am confident in myself. Self-reliant, meaning yourself, doesn't need any other selves to lean on or to depend on. That you can take care of yourself. You're self-reliant. You rely on no one else. You rely on yourself. Self-assured, meaning I know what I can do. I know what I can do. Matter of fact, I can be self-assured. I can be self-reliant because I'm self-assured. I know what I can do and I am confident in my abilities to solve problems and to find solutions that will keep my life stable. I can be self-assured. I can be assured of how life is going to go because of my abilities. I'm confident in myself and myself's abilities to solve problems and to find solutions. And then finally, when we say self-fulfilled, it means I will do enough to make myself happy and content in life. I will fulfill myself. I'll make enough money to satisfy myself. I'll accomplish enough in my career. I'll date and marry the person that will make myself happy and feel proud of myself. And all the married people laugh right now. I'll buy the house of my dreams. We'll go on trips and vacations and the trips of our dreams. We will be fulfilled by the things that we do and the things that we make and what we accomplish. I am going to be fulfilled by myself. We expect of ourselves that we will be self-confident, self-reliant, self-assured, and self-fulfilled selves. That's what we hope is true of ourselves. Now, you can probably already see some potential problems with that list, but I think we can all acknowledge that that is the life that we have all been sold is the goal. That if you can live life and move through life self-confident, self-reliant, self-assured, and self-fulfilled, then you win. And yourself becomes the self that you were meant to to be, that you were born to be, that you were created to be. But like I said, we can already see the trouble with that because for even the most confident of us, let's be honest, there are times that you are confident in yourself and times you have absolutely no idea who you are. And you can go back and forth of those every hour of the day, every day of the week, every week of the month. I'm like, you can go back and forth between completely confident and completely unconfident all the time. Matter of fact, let me tell you one of the biggest ways that this plays out where we know ourselves sometimes and we don't always know who we are other times, where we feel confident in our identity sometimes and we don't feel confident in our identity a lot of times. What, what tends to play out is that when we, get, when we get into family life as we grow up, we tend to be confident in who we are at work, at the gym, in our friendships, in our hobbies, but in family relationships, we default to the role that we played in our family of origin. We haven't, in other words, we haven't made a healthy break from our family of origin, and therefore we deal with all kinds of unresolved things that keep us from being confident of who we are in our family relationships. So yeah, sometimes we're confident, but we're not always confident in ourselves. We want to be self-confident, and sometimes we are, and sometimes we aren't. Sometimes we're self-reliant, and we really don't need anyone else because we're, we're going to work hard to take care of ourselves. But you also know that as much as you want to take care of yourself, you can't always take care of yourself. And even the times you can, let's be honest, we're not always very good at knowing what is truly best for ourselves. This is why occasionally we, we get the idea of self-care wrong. And I'm not saying ba anything bad about taking care of yourself. I think we should all absolutely take care of ourselves. But the reason we sometimes get this wrong is because we think we know what it takes to care for ourselves when oftentimes what we need is very different than what we think we need. We are very bad at identifying what we actually need to care for ourselves and to, and to provide for ourselves. We're actually very bad at knowing what we need. So sometimes we can be self-reliant and we can care for ourselves and we can care for others and we can take care of our world. And other times we get completely blinded to what we really need. And so we can't even fully rely on ourselves all the time. So sometimes we're self-reliant, other times we're not. Sometimes we're self-assured and we and then we all know that our trust in our abilities has its limits. I'm pretty confident in a lot of my abilities, but I reach the end of them frequently while both of our daughters were newborns. I think anyone who has had a newborn, you reach the limits of your abilities at some point along the way. I remember one night when Jalen had gone to bed kind of early with a, a, a migraine and I was taking care of Noble and feeding her and planning to put her down to bed shortly after when she didn't seem satisfied with her normal amount of milk. And as a father, you're like, well, what do I do? 
Do I give her more? Do I let her cry it out? She's crying for a long time. She's crying for like 20 whole minutes and now 30 minutes. So what? I, so, so I'm like, okay, so I'm gonna try to give her a little bit more milk. She didn't seem satisfied with that or she didn't burp. Like, I, I don't know. So I tried giving her a little bit more milk and she seemed satisfied while she was drinking the milk. But then as soon as that milk ran out, she seemed like she was really fussy and crying again. I'm like, okay, so let's get a little bit more milk. She just must, must want more and more milk. And I remember I gave her what she had at the time where she was typically drinking 2.5 ounces of, of milk and I gave her what amounted to 5.75 ounces of milk in one setting. Now you could imagine what would happen next. She seemed completely satisfied and I held her up and she seemed really content and I got a one good burp out of her and I went, oh, are you good? And I looked at her in the face and then she started puking all over me, just puking all over me. We were sitting downstairs in the, in the living room and I'm like, okay, all right, so she puked on me and then she puked more and she puked more and she puked more and I'm covered with puke and she's covered with puke and Jalen's upstairs and I'm thinking, the last thing that I want to do is go wake up Jalen because I know she has this terrible headache. I don't want to go wake up Jalen, but I'm covered in puke and she's covered in puke and if one of us was covered in puke, I know what to do, but I don't even know how to handle it when both of us are covered in puke. So I walked upstairs, I opened the bedroom door, I turned on the light, Jalen kind of stirs and goes, what's, what's What's going on? I said, I just don't even know what to do. I, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, and I just like, that's what happened. We, we were so self-assured in our own abilities, but, and, and, we, and we laugh about the kid puking, but let's be honest, we all have times where we have reached the end of our abilities. We've reached the limits of our abilities. And as self-assured as we want to be, as, as, as self-confident as we want to be in our abilities, we go, I, I just, I don't even know what to do. In family, life, I don't even know what to do. In work, I don't even know what to do. As far as my career, I don't even know what to do. As far as affording everything or not, I, I don't even know what to do. So what do we do? We wanna be self-assured, but we all know there's times when we're not. And the goal of being self-fulfilled may be the hardest to understand of all because if you get everything that you think you will need in order to be self-fulfilled, here's what will happen. You will develop new appetites that need to be satisfied. And if you work hard and create a good life, but you don't meet your own expectations, and hopes and dreams. Here's what happens. You will do some great things, but you will feel like you're failing while accomplishing great things. The goal of being self-fulfilled is a terrifying goal because if you reach it, you find there's new goals. And if you don't reach it, you feel like a failure while you're doing really good things. So here's the thing we all realize at some point along the way. Yourself is never really enough for yourself. Yourself is never really enough for yourself. You can't ever, as much as you want to be self-confident, you can never fully be confident in yourself. As much as you want to be self-reliant, you know there's times, like I know like there's times where ourselves are not enough to rely on. You know there's times where you want to be self-assured, but you know there are limits to what yourself is capable of. And you want to fulfill yourself and you want to reach all your goals and you want to meet all your appetites. But you know, like I know, that there are times where you, where you can get everything that you hoped you and dreamed and you're still not satisfied because you know there's more. And you know that there's times where you, will get, where you will get really close, but you'll feel like a failure while doing some really good things. Yourself is never really enough for yourself. And that should lead us to a really interesting question. If you realize that, if, 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 if saying that makes you pop up and go, you know, I've never really thought of it, but, but that's exactly what I deal with every single day. That should lead us to a really good question. And the really good question is simply this. What do you do with yourself when yourself isn't enough for yourself? What do you do with yourself when yourself isn't enough for yourself? And interestingly enough, the example of Jesus gives us a direction to go when we realize that our self isn't enough for ourself and tells us what we should do with ourself. But there is a reason this isn't our default and there's a reason we don't do with ourself what Jesus did with his self. The example that Jesus established to help us know what to do with ourselves, it's so different from what you expect and the world around you expects from you that it sounds ridiculous to do this with yourself. It actually almost sounds a little dangerous, but here's what Paul wrote about Jesus's example and the example that Jesus set of what to do with ourselves. In Philippians chapter two, starting in verse, verse five, Paul wrote this. He said, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Meaning he had all strength 
but he didn't leverage his strength for his own benefit or for his own self. He had all wisdom, but he didn't leverage his intelligence for his own benefit or for his own self. He was the only person to ever deserve to be self-confident, and he did not use his confidence to feed his own ego or his own arrogance or his own pride or his own self. He was the only person ever truly capable of doing anything he ever needed or wanted. Just imagine being Jesus and having all power and all ability, could have done anything he needed, anything he wanted at any given moment of any given day, could have met every desire he ever had. And he did not use that ability to assure himself. And then Paul lets us know what he did instead of doing that. Because let's be honest, if if we had all the power and all the ability and all the wisdom and all the strength, we would use it to feed ourself. We would use it to make sure that we are self-confident, to make sure that we are self-assured, to make sure that we are self-reliant, and to make sure that we are are self-fulfilled. We would use it to feed ourselves. And Paul says, Jesus never did that. But here's what he did and said in verse seven. He says, instead, he emptied himself. Instead, instead of feeding himself, he emptied himself. Himself. Instead of leveraging himself to feed himself and to blow up himself and to make his self seem bigger and to make his self seem more important and to satisfy and to fulfill himself and to rely on himself and to make, make, him, make sure that he was self-assured and to make sure that he was confident in himself. Instead of doing that, what Jesus did with himself is Jesus emptied himself. Now, other translations kind of use the language when when, when translating this to say, instead, he made himself nothing. In other words, Jesus took everything about his self, every hope, every dream, every desire, every want, every comfort, every need, every ability, every intelligence, every confidence, and every assurance, and he submitted them all to the will and the purpose of his Father in heaven, and your Father in heaven. And Paul says to you and to me, would you follow the example that your Savior set for you? You are to have that same mindset that every hope, dream, desire, want, comfort, need, ability, confidence, and assurance that you have, it is to be placed at the feet of Jesus and in the hands of your heavenly Father. That everything that you think matters is to be submitted before the one who matters more. That everything that you think is of value is to be placed in the hands of the one who is ultimately valuable. And here's the thing, I told you that this sounds dangerous. Let me tell you why this sounds dangerous. This sounds dangerous to us because we think, well, if I don't care about those things, no one will. If I don't think about, if I don't care about my own self-confidence, no one's going to care about my self-confidence. If I don't care about making sure that I have someone in myself to rely on, no, I may not have anyone to rely on. If I don't make sure that I'm taking care of my abilities and using my abilities to take care of myself, no one else is going to look after myself. If I don't chase down my dreams, no one's going to chase down my dreams. If I don't care about those things, no one will. And we also think if I don't make myself a priority, no one will. And in the face of that, here's what I want to say to maybe ease your fears about submitting everything that about yourself into the hands of of our heavenly father. We think I don't, if I don't care about those things, no one will. You know, I want to know who those things will matter to. You want to know who those things will matter to? They will matter to the one who loves you enough to die for you. Like, wait, wait, wait. If I stop caring about those things so much, they'll actually still matter to God who loves me enough that he would send his son to die for me? Yes. Your heavenly father loves you and he cares for you. and He cares for your whole self and everything that matters to you. If I don't make myself a priority, no one will. Well, you know who you're a priority to? You are a priority to the God who loves you so much. He laid down his life for you. You can take your whole self like Jesus did and place your whole self, everything that matters to you, your confidence, your reliance, your assurance, and your fulfillment. You can take every bit of that, everything that you hope and dream of, everything that you care about, everything that you pray for, you can take all of it and place it into the hands of your heavenly father, knowing that he knows what is best for yourself, that he has a plan for yourself, that he has purposes for yourself, that he has what is best for you when you don't know what is best for you. And that's why you can trust him. And that's why you can empty yourself. And that's why you can submit your whole self into the hands of your heavenly father. 
Paul went on, he said this, instead he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, as you read that, as you read that together from Philippians chapter 2, here's what's amazing about that. That last part is what Jesus came to do. That was Jesus' entire mission in life. And none of that happens. None of the laying down his life on a cross, none of the resurrection, none of it raised to the glory of God the Father to become the bridge between God and man. None of that happens if he didn't empty himself first. Because if Jesus' life was all about what he could do by himself and handle by himself and accomplish by himself, lived according to his own comfort and what he thought he needed at any given moment, a death on a cross isn't even close to the top of his list. The only way that Jesus accomplishes what he was supposed to accomplish in life is if first and foremost, at the outset and every single day, he surrendered and submitted himself before the one who is over all. See, here's the thing that I think, as we look to this scripture, here's one way of saying what I, what I think we need to understand, that yourself needs to live for something beyond yourself. Yourself needs to live for something beyond yourself. And I could, if I could even clarify it a little bit more, yourself needs to live for someone beyond yourself. Yourself needs to live a life where yourself is surrendered to God and to his plans and to his purposes. And until you do, let me just tell you this, nothing in your life and honestly nothing about yourself will ultimately make sense. Until you do, all of your striving will simply be striving. Until you do, all your effort will be wasted effort. Until you do, all your confidence will be misplaced. And until you do, all your abilities will lead you to places that are ultimately unfulfilling. Yourself needs to live for something and someone beyond yourself. And let me tell you what happens when you do. When you do, only living for someone beyond yourself will you discover everything that you actually need. That you don't need self-confidence. You need confidence that God is with you and that God is for you. You don't need self-reliance. You need a God that can supply every need that you will ever have. You don't need self-assurance. You need a God who is capable when you are not. And you don't need self-fulfillment. You need a God who will lead you to a life of purpose and plans that he has that are truly fulfilling. When you live a life where you surrender yourself into the hands of God and submit yourself into the hands of God. And when you stop living for yourself, but you place yourself before a loving heavenly father, you will find that everything that you think matters is found in the hands of God. That everything that you hope and that you strive for is found in submission and surrender to your heavenly father. Yourself needs to live a life surrendered to someone beyond yourself. And that someone should be your heavenly father who loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you and his son came and emptied himself and laid himself down to pay the punishment for your sins, to pay the price for your sins so that you could have a relationship with your heavenly father. Now, Interestingly enough, one of the best examples that we have of this emptying of a self, it doesn't actually come to us from Jesus, although that's, Jesus is the ultimate example of this. But one of the most clear examples that we get in Scripture, it doesn't come from Jesus, but it comes from a cousin of Jesus, whose followers thought that his self was in competition with Jesus' self. In John chapter 3, John the Baptist, we know him as John the Baptist, Says, says this in verse 26. So John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man that you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one that you identified as the Messiah, is also baptizing people. And everyone is going into him instead of coming to us. Now to John's followers, here's, here's, the, here's the idea. Jesus had been baptized by John, and now Jesus is off on the other side of the river baptizing people himself, and now more people are going to Jesus than coming to John. And so to John's followers, they're going, John, look, you are known as John the Baptist. 
And that's not because of a denomination that you're going to start, that's going to start in, in, in someday. That's not, that's not why you're known as John the Baptist. You're known as John the Baptist because baptizing is your thing. It's like your whole identity. It's the main thing you do. It's why people will recognize you and it's how you'll be known for the rest of eternity. And if that dude starts baptizing more people than you, yourself is going to start losing the spotlight. So do something to get the people back over here. Do something to get the attention back on yourself. Do something so people know that you're confident. Do something of yourself so that people know that they can rely on you. Do something that assures the people that you know what you're doing more than he knows what he's doing. Do something that fulfills your mission and gets everybody focused on yourself. And here's what John did in verse 27 in the following verses. John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you I'm not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. I mean, we could just stop there. I am filled with joy at his success because this has never been about me and myself. This has always been to point the way to him. This has always been to prepare the way for him. What I came to do when I came to baptize was to prepare the way and to prepare the path for the work that he would ultimately do to bring repentance that would bring our eyes to him. I am filled with joy at his success. But then John said this, and this is something that I hope we could all just latch onto when it comes to the emptying of ourselves. John said this, he must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. Matter of fact, can we, can we say that all together on the counter? I know wherever you are, you may have headphones in, you may be in a park, you may be in a living room where no one else is watching, but could you say this with me on the counter three? Ready? One, two, three. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. That was John's mission in life, that he would become greater and greater, and me and myself would become less and less. Now, for John to say this, I mean, wow. John had an amazing angelic foretold birth story just like Jesus did. He, I mean, like he was Jesus's cousin. He was part of the family. He, like he, Jesus actually, in fact, speaking of John later, Jesus would say of John, he said, I tell you in the kingdom of heaven, there has not been one who has come greater than John. And John says, look, as much as I've got a great birth story, as much as I'm part of the family, and as much as I've been doing some really great work that has led to, to this point, I don't ultimately matter. My life only matters so much as I take it and I surrender it into the hands and into the plans of my heavenly Father, and what my heavenly Father has asked me to do is to pour out myself to point the way to the Savior. My heavenly Father has asked me to lay down my life, to take every bit of my confidence, every bit of my assurance, every bit of my ability, every bit of my reliance, every bit of what I want in order to fulfill my life, to take everything I have, to place it into His hands, and to live according to His purposes and to His plans and to point the way to his son, the savior of the world. And as long as I am doing that, myself can rest confident knowing that God is with me, knowing that I am doing what God has asked of me, knowing that I'm doing what God has called called me to. And so, so all I need to know and all I need to say is he must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. So here's the thing that I, that I would hope maybe we can pray together today. What if we decided in regards to ourself, what if every single day yourself woke up this week and prayed, God, let my life be less and less of me and more and more of you. What if that was how you started every day this week? God, let myself be less and less of me and more and more of you. God, let my life be less and less of me and more and more of you. And you could take it and you could personalize it a little bit more depending on how, how this looks for you. God, let my family be less and less of me and more and more of you. 
God, let my thought life be less and less of me and more and more of you. God, let my work be less of me and more of you. God, let my teaching be less of me and more and more of you. God, let my spare time be less and less of me and more and more of you. God, let my attitude be less and less of me and more and more guided by you. God, let my responses and my reactions be less and less of me and more and more guided by you and what you have for me and what you want from me. God, let myself be less and less of me and more and more of you. Maybe, just maybe, that's what God wants from your self. More than he wants you to be self-confident, more than he wants you to be self-reliant, more than he wants you to be self-assured, and more than he wants you to be self-fulfilled. He wants you to empty yourself, to make yourself nothing, but to place yourself into his hands, to submit and to surrender everything that's in your hands into his loving hands. And here's the thing, if we'll learn to pray that way, and if we'll learn to live that way, where we invite God to be more and more in our lives and allow ourselves to be less and less the center of our lives, I think we will find ourselves discovering that God is and has everything that we will ever need. And that is a great place to start in discovering yourself. So today I want to give you an invitation as we close, we're, in, we're about to move into a time of prayer. But as we move to, to the conclusion today, I want to invite you to take yourself and to trust yourself in the hands of the God who has a plan and a purpose for you. The God who sent his son to die because sin had separated yourself from himself. Who sent his son to die because sin was such a problem, because your sin was a problem. And God who sent a solution to your greatest problem his son Jesus, who died on the cross for your sin, who rose from the dead so that you could have a new life and a new connection with your heavenly father. And if you want to place your trust in him, it looks like that. It looks like simply placing your trust in Jesus's death for yourself and for your sin and trusting in his resurrection to bring you new life and connection with your heavenly father. If you'd like to do that, this is how you do this, that. This is how you begin to trust in your heavenly father. This is how you begin to submit and surrender yourself into his plans and into his hands. So today I'm going to pray a prayer, and I would encourage you while I pray, I would encourage you, if that's you, to make a decision and to pray and to ask your Heavenly Father to forgive your sins, to accept Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, and to make you new as you step into the new life that he has for you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you that he came and that he emptied himself that he made himself nothing, that he took his entire self and he placed it into your loving hands, your loving, good, strong, confident, assured hands. Thank you that because of Jesus, we can take ourselves and we can surrender and submit ourselves into your hands, knowing that you have what is best for us, knowing that you are what is best for us, and knowing that you have everything that we ever will need and everything that we could ever want. So God, help us to take ourselves and place ourselves into your hands. Help us to follow the example of Jesus. Help us to follow the example of John. And God, help us to live a life that says less and less of me and more and more of you. God, may we pray that today. May we pray that every day this week. May we pray that every day for the rest of our lives so that ourselves can be filled with more and more of who you are and what you want for us. We love you, God. Give us wisdom to recognize what we need to do and give us courage to actually do it. We pray this all in Jesus' strong name. Amen.
shadow in the sunlight. It's my joy for my whole life to praise your name. But sing it out.
Well, it's been a great day together today. Hopefully you found today, as we worshiped, as we studied the Bible together, hopefully you found it inspiring and challenging and encouraging. Hopefully you've been able to take some step in your relationship with Jesus Christ to become a better follower of Jesus because of what happened in this 45 minutes together. I want to let you know a few steps that you can take in connecting and engaging with our church. First of all, I want to let you know that, that if you want to give, the ways that you can give are listed on screen right now. You can give online, you can give by text, you can give to our cash app, or you can give by sending uh, a check in the mail to our P.O. box. But I just want to say, however and whenever you give, thank you so much for your generosity. When you give to the local church, when you give to our church, it helps to create environments and experiences where people are able to take their first step or their next step in a relationship with Jesus Christ and grow, grow closer to being the follower of Jesus that Jesus wants them to be. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for believing in the mission and the vision of Movement Church to keep creating environments that help people taking steps closer to Jesus. Also want to let you know if you have a need today, we would love to hear from you and hopefully be able to help you. We want to pray for you. We want to be able to partner with you if there's a way that we can partner to meet your need, but we can't do that unless we hear from you. So the ways that you can let us know are either by email, by phone, or by Facebook. And those are not those numbers and those information, all that information is on screen right now. We would love to hear from you so we can know how to partner with you in prayer in and meeting your need. And then finally, we want to let you know that our kids' experiences are live right now and every Sunday at 10 a.m. on both Facebook and YouTube. And they're a great way to keep your kids engaged and growing in their faith on a Sunday or throughout the week. So we'd love for you to check those out and keep your little ones engaged and growing closer to Jesus. Well, that's all we got for you today. We'll look forward to seeing you next week for part two of our series, Self. And until then, have a great week and keep being the movement.